Yeah. Yeah. Hello and welcome to Afro Space with me, Adetun Jomotola, and my partner, Inyasha Grace. Today we have joining us on Afro Space is Stacy Pinto. Stacy Pinto is the CEO of the Namibia Trade Forum, and Tracy has extensive experience. She's a, an author, best selling author. She's also a much sought after trade professional, and she has worked for the UK government in the past in economic diplomacy. Ceci, welcome to Afrospace. Hello, Aditunji. Thank you so much. Hello, Nyasha. Thank you so much for having me. You're very welcome. Now, Tracy, Afrospace, I forgot to share with you that we are an online weekly show that brings to you issues around Pan-African, issues of Pan-African nature, and we are seen all the way in diaspora as well. Over to you, Nyasha. All right. Okay, Stacey, thank you so much for obviously coming and having this conversation with us. And uh, just, I think, to start us off in our conversation, can you just tell us a little bit about Namibia? If you could just give us a, a picture and of, of what makes Namibia special, any distinguishing features on the country, the demographics. And for those who don't know much about Namibia, just give them uh, some highlights on, on, on the great nation of Namibia. Thank you. Thank you, Nyasha. And I love your sort of concluding remark on that question. It is mm. a great nation. Um, in our national anthem, we actually refer to our people as the brave ones. And it, it has a lot of historical context as to why that is um, that way. But I just want to paint you a picture. So I've been thinking about this. I had a chat with Adetunji yesterday and just thinking through I mean, I've lived here over 12 years. And so I was thinking, you know, what makes us tick? Who we are, who are we as a nation? And most importantly, looking at it through Africa's view and Africa's perspective. I honestly think that Namibia is Africa's hidden gem. No doubt. We are a small country, but packed with so much potential, packed with such beauty. I'll walk you through a little bit of what is in Namibia. So in our national anthem, you would hear a lot about contrasting beauty. It means exactly that. So if I could take you, just imagine this. If I could take you right to the Zambezi region, the border, the, the, the town that borders Zambia, um, Sesheke on the Zambian side and Katimamlilo on the Namibian side, we have fresh river water there. It shares a border with Zambia. And so there's the Zambezi very prevalent there. We have a very huge culture of fishing and farming and sort of culture very similar to Zambia. You start to come up the country to your Rundu area, your farming area, it borders Angola. And actually it's, it's, it's such a fantastic story because Rundu borders Angola on one side. And literally when you sit at the deck of one lodge, you're looking over into Angola. And students from Angola come into Namibia to shop and to go to school and they use a canoe. Those are fantastic stories that Africa doesn't know, but that's just how Pan-African we are. When you go down to the north, there's a village called Ohangwena and it too, literally Angola is, you cross the road and you're in Angola. The people in that village go and fetch water in Angola just by crossing the street. You come up, there's the fruit Fountain area, lovely rainfall, very similar to Zambia, a huge farming area there. You're coming closer to the um, Ochuarongo area, coming to Vinduk, which is the pot, the center of it all, where the power seats, where the big banks are. And that sends you on a tangent of, of sort of areas. On the one side, you could go down to the coast, which is Swakopmund. There's, of course, the ocean there. We have the biggest dunes in the world, Nyasha. Yeah. Um, you literally have 
a large dune on one side, you have a road in the middle and right across is the ocean. And at one point wow. they meet. You have never seen such beauty in your life. <laughs> we have fantastic wildlife um, in the Etosha National Park. So that's what we mean when we say contrasting beauty. We have the most luxurious sunsets you've ever seen on the African continent. Wow. Top that off, we have guaranteed 300 days of sunshine. Now that is music to anyone's ears. I know we're talking about winter earlier, but Namibia is, it's home, it's Pan-African, it's, it's, it's just amazing. When we talk about the people, we have diverse cultures. We have the Owambos, we have the Oshereros, the Namas, the Damara, the Sun, the oldest people who lived, sort of have history in the world are in Namibia. So very diverse but very Pan-African, um, very inviting. You do know I'm Zambian. I've been here over 12 years and never have I ever felt that I'm foreign here. If anything, I always make a joke. When I was in uni, I would go home to Zambia and after the holidays, I'd be like, oh, mommy, I need to plan. I need to go back home. And she's like, um, you are home. I'm like, oh, oh, by the way, the other home. So that is Namibia for you. We have such beauty. We have fantastic people. We have lovely food. So our famous one, and I know at the Tunji, you have some similar street food in Nigeria, but guaranteed Namibia has the best. It's called mm -hmm. Kapana. So it's literally meat that we buy on the street and you eat it with fat cook. Um, I don't know if you know what fat cook is, but yeah. it's a, yeah just the most amazing thing you've ever eaten. Um, so that's who we are, lovely. Our governance is good. Mo Ibrahim rated us fifth, I think in 2015. We're coming up on sports diplomacy. We're coming up on green hydrogen. We're coming up on trade. So like I said, I think we really are Africa's hidden gem. Not for long though. Okay, now um, Stacy, you've given us a perspective about how diverse Namibia is and all the flora and fauna and the beautiful flora and fauna of the country and even talked about Kapana, which is like, yes. like Suya in Nigeria. Yes, Suya. I was looking for that name. I actually wanted to Google it. I'm like, but what will I ask Google? Yeah, that is like, the correct one. It's like Suya in Nigeria. <laughs> yes, okay. yes, yes. And um, not too far from Biltong in South Africa, not too far. Okay. Now, can you give us a sense of, uh, Nam we know Namibia, the population is not uh, a big country like, you know, your Ghana, your Nigeria and Congo. But can you give us a sense of the drivers of the Namibian economy? What are the key indicators mm. that are driving it? Like oil will be a mm. driver in mm. Nigeria, mm. diamonds mm. in Botswana. Mm. So you're right. Um, we are a small nation in terms of the number of people, not so much size. So we have plus or minus um, 2.5 million people. And, and of course, that's one of the beautiful things about the country as well. It's just that we have vast, mass, mass land and sort of space, if I can say that. But in terms of what drives our economy, and I'm sort of going to qualify this because I'm of the view that in the past year and a bit, that is slowly starting to change. So traditionally, what used to drive our economy was, of course, mining, which was your diamonds, your uranium, zinc, a bit of copper coming to the fore. Of course, fishing, it's a massive industry. We export, of course, um, through the European Union, EPA, um, fish to um, the UK, etc. cetera. Um, agriculture also has started to contribute quite greatly to um, the GDP. And then of course, tourism. So I think those have been the main ones. And then um, I think about from about four years back, construction was also quite huge. Um, but our economy sort of shrunk a little bit in the past five to seven years. We have not had as much economic um, activity as we would ordinarily like. And the main ones that suffered was construction. Um, and that's purely because um, we didn't see as much trade going on with Angola. Um, our fiscus was sort of feeling a bit of pressure. So construction sort of started to die down. Uh, mining is a traditional one, but I did mention that the upcoming one now is green hydrogen. If you've been following what's been going on in our country, our Minister of Finance um, was on 
CNN a couple of months back talking about this project. So it's promising to be the biggest green hydrogen project in Africa once it's done in Namibia. And then, of course, cosmetics is really coming to the fore as well. So I think as a country, we're in transition. We're starting to move away from those traditional things or sources of revenue and really trying to not only be creative, but to focus on that which we're good at, but also that which allows us to add more value and obviously create more jobs. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely fantastic. And I think just the uh, way that the economy is diversifying is something that um, I think a lot of African countries are still trying to reach to. Okay, so um, just to bring the question a little closer to home for you, Stacey, um, tell us, as the CEO uh, of the Namibian Trade um, Forum, NTF, uh, tell us, uh, for our viewers who, who are interested to learn about some of the work that you do, Give us some highlights of what the forum, the trade forum is uh, currently embarking on. Right. Um, so in, in sort of a quick um, view, the Namibia Trade Forum was created to fill a specific gap. And this gap was the following. When we went to trade negotiations um, as Namibia, of course, through SACU, SADIC or any other regional platforms, we were finding that we didn't have as as real a reflection from the private sector as we would like to allow us, of course, go to the negotiating table. Mm -hmm. And so that gap became so prevalent that we needed to try and create an institution that manages how private sector feeds into trade negotiations. So the Namibia Trade Forum was set up to be the touch point between government and the private sector and make sure that when we as government go to any platform, be it trade negotiations, policy, etc., we really had our finger on the pulse with the private sector because essentially government doesn't trade. We only create policy, but it's the private sector that's going to use it. So we wanted to be sure and clear that when we are done with this huge piece of policy or trade, that it's fit for purpose for the private sector. And then importantly as well, when we come back from those trade agreements, it was important for the private sector to understand what are the entry points. You're talking about an EU static trade agreement. What does that mean? What's the benefit? So it was really to close the gap and making sure that the policy we're creating is fit for purpose for the private sector, but also the private sector crucially understands how they can benefit from trade agreements. So that's the gap that the Namibia Trade Forum fills. And I think tangent to that is the idea around promoting local products on the market shelves. So because Namibia almost about imports all of what it eats, there was at one point a scenario where you'd walk into a shop and you wouldn't find anything Namibian on the, on the shelves. Mm -hmm. And so the Namibia Trade Forum is the custodian of a tool called the Retail Sector Charter. And that was primarily put together to improve how much local uh, market access producers had. And I'm so proud of this because we've seen that local retailers are now procuring close to 60% local products. And that's what we want. So that's ideally in a heartbeat what we do. Okay. Now, um, Stacy, can you give us a sense? I was reading somewhere that the Namibian economy has contracted I think in 2020, by about 7%, tourism has taken a knock. Also, you alluded to that earlier, the construction. There's been some kind of a challenge over the last few years. And of course, your population has increased. I think it used to be about 1.8 million about a decade ago. So you guys are enjoying the, the you know, boom in terms of your population. I know Africa, we, we're always healthy on the population side. But can yes. you give us can you give us a sense of the challenges that the Namibian economy faces? And I know that you've got a fourth national development plan as well. Can you talk to that as well in terms of you know what steps have been taken to address that? And also, can you give us a sense of how COVID has affected uh, mm. Namibians as well? Mm. Right. So um, you're right. We are in the national development plan number four, but the fifth one is being crafted. And what that does is sort of give us a long-term view of where we're going as a country. But what the government has done so beautifully is that they have created what we call the Harambe Prosperity Plan. I don't know if you, you came across that in your reading. So the Harambe Prosperity Plan literally draws down from our national development plans and breaks down those activities that we need to do in the short term to allow us meet that end-term end term goal. So we're now 
now on Harambe Prosperity Planet. It obviously has different economic pillars. And that's where we're seeing the creativity coming through. I, I don't know if you've seen this, but what our president has done fantastically is he has appointed a number of advisors. So on economics, on youth, on gender, etc. And they're the ones that are leading on those pillars and really making sure that they're engaging with the private sector and the country at large. Number one, to share plans, but also to make sure that those plans are fit for purpose, like I mentioned. So um, that's what we're doing in terms of bringing the national development plans to reality. There is a drawdown document called the Harambe Prosperity Plan, and that's the one that's really creating targets, deadlines, and activities towards meeting those national development plans. In terms of challenges, um, I'll start with COVID and then sort of go back. Of course, COVID, I think, I imagine has been the biggest one for, for everyone, not only in Africa. And what that has done um, quite sadly for Namibia is it has crippled our tourism industry. I'm highlighting the tourism industry because it's one of our biggest employers in the lodges, the cleaning, the catering, the activities, it has a lot of sort of ripple effects that come down the chain. So um, of course that has had an impact not only on our growth or our, our, our fiscus, but also on job creation. So that's number one. Um, what the other thing that COVID has done is obviously shrunk the purse, shrunk government's purse. So now instead of spending that $100 to create another job, you're spending the $100 to buy vaccines, to make sure people are tested, to improve your health, et cetera. So there's a bit of, been a bit of a fight as to what is important for which finances. And of course, what we would spend money on ordinarily is, is not the case and we're needing to, to combat COVID-19. And as a result, because the buying power is reducing not only for government, but we know that in most African countries, government's the biggest spender. So if government's not spending as much, it means that businesses are not making as much. Um, sadly, last month, we what we were counting is that about 83 businesses had closed since the first um, lockdown of COVID last year. So it's been really, really hectic. And for population our size, 88 businesses is a lot. Because if we say that those businesses each employ three people, multiply effect, how many households? So you can sort of see the picture of what's going on. Um, in terms of what we've battled with as a country, even before COVID, and COVID has had other impacts, but just to run through the general ones, we've been struggling with drug I think the past three, two to three rain seasons, we didn't have as much rain. So that means we were not producing as much as we would ordinarily want. And that means the farmers weren't getting in money. And of course, it affects job creation, markets, etc. Um, the other thing that has suffered, of course, is our trade and our retail. So you, you would know that South Africa and Namibia trade quite closely. And because of the drought, we didn't have as many cattle to trade as we would want. Most of them were dying because of the drought. And so quite a number of diverse factors from weather um, inclined factors to COVID to economics, quite a mixed bag. Um, but I think what's important and what makes us strong as a people is just the resilience. Do look out because we're, we're soon starting to recreate what we're doing as a country. And that I think is the most fantastic thing, just bouncing back from, from where we've been. Yeah, okay. One of the big visions for Namibia currently is uh, to become the regional leader in logistics uh, on the continent. Uh, can you perhaps just to help us understand um, some of the steps that the country is currently taking to achieve this and uh, become the logistics giant of the continent? Great. Thanks, Nyasha. So I think after the call, I'll share a map with you because then it, it helps situate what we're talking about and why we, we see ourselves as crucial. We, we, we call ourselves the gateway into Southern Africa. And I know the day and the time is quickly coming where Namibia will become the default landing place in Southern Africa. I know South Africa has done some fantastic work there, but we know what's going on and we see what's happening. And so I think for Namibia, it also gives us a niche to assert ourselves in the region and really take a share of the market. So if you look at Namibia in terms of the southern part of, of, of Africa, we literally have access into a number of countries. We have quite a bit with Zimbabwe, we have Zambia, we have Botswana, and then through Zambia, we have the DRC, we have Angola, we have South Africa. So what Namibia is trying to do is, um, of course, using the 
port of Luteris, which is the second deep, natural deepest um, birth canal outside Durban, to have traffic come in from the, 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 the US, the UK, um, yes, the Europe's and the Americas, dock in the Luteritz area, and that becomes a distribution center to get into the rest of Southern Africa. So what we're doing is, of course, in ensuring that the infrastructure in that sense is done. I think we're 90% there. We've been extending that port. We've been putting infrastructure. We've been making sure that even from a tourism perspective, it makes sense. So that's been the one end. We've also been developing our rail railway system. Transnamib has been revamping itself to position itself as a cheaper mode of transportation transportation outside um, road. And then our roads are just brilliant. Um, there was a Ghanaian Aditunji in the country, I think three months, three weeks back. Um, um, Wodemaya, I think he came and visited and he literally mm -hmm. said, I've heard that Namibia has great roads and I never believed it, but now I see it everywhere I go. There's straight road, it's clear and you literally can drive. So we're positioning ourselves to be the place that the world lands to get into other markets. And I think that's the beauty of Namibia is that if you trade with us, your market is not restricted to Namibia. You have access into five other countries through us. Okay. Now, just give us a sense, uh, Stacy. You know, in Africa, they say uh, South Africa is the nozzle, Nigeria is the trigger. And Nigeria is the largest economy with 200 million people. And I know that wherever you talk about Nigeria, they talk about Ghana and also Kenya is also significant. Of course, we know Zimbabwe is in your region. You're already working with the DRC. Ethiopia as well is a critical country as well as Rwanda. Now, since you're very good at economic diplomacy and you work for the UK government, you're now doing stuff with the Nigeria, uh, sorry, the Namibian government for trade in the region, in Africa. What is the relationship that Namibia has with these countries on an economic basis? And how is that going at the moment? Give us a sense of that. Um, uh, I think the start point is that there's so much more to be done in terms of the relations between not only Namibia, but this region and, and ECOWAS up the African map. I think our relationship has really been meeting in trade negotiation rooms and you know, discussing trade related stuff. And that's been about it. But I'm of the view, especially with the coming on of the AFCFTA, we really have to come to a point where we are matching what our best offers are and seeing how to create value that we can export to the world. Um, so what we're busy with now as Namibia is our national AFCFTA implementation plan. So we're busy drawing up plans and looking at those points that we leverage quite well and to see whether they scope for potential value chains in the region. So obviously our default has been the Southern African market, this regional economic um, community, but they scope for so much more. I was saying to you yesterday that I had a call a couple of months back with ECOWAS businesses and literally they cannot wait to come and do business in Namibia. They cannot wait to come and access our markets. So I think we can do a bit more, not only as Namibia, but as Africans to understand each other and learn how to do business because we've never come to this point where we're saying we're going to create the biggest market with, with, with all of our continent. So I think for everyone, there's, there's space to just strengthen those relationships and make sure that number one, people can move with ease because that's who moves business, but also that we can create value chains that allow us as Africa to really export some fantastic products from our continent. Okay. Yeah. I mean, um, so you, you pretty much also kind of touched on, on the last question I was going to ask you the uh, Stacey, but uh, perhaps just, you know, close it up for us and, and just telling us a little bit more around the potential of uh, the African continental free trade um, agreement uh, and particularly what do you think as a trade specialist uh, needs to be done to accelerate the work um, that uh, the, um, you know, that AFTA has to, has to do to uh, merge Africa as, a, as an economic bloc? Nyasha, I'll, I'll be honest. It's ambitious, very, very ambitious. Yeah. It's huge, but it can work. It'll take us time to get there because there's a lot of things that we need to come into agreement with. 
things like rules of origin, things like moving people. There's so many bits that need to come together to make sense. And we are on our way there, but it'll be a long walk. So when we do the work as African countries, and by that, I mean, at some point, we've got to make concessions. We have to come to the point. And I think that's why the political will is a really great indicator, because at the highest level of office, if that willingness is there, it trickles down and really shares the importance of why that tool is important. And so when we do the work, and by the work, I mean concede where we need to, concede for the greater good. Of course, yeah. as countries, we're sovereign countries, we want to protect our industries, we want to protect our interests, but are there things that we can forego to reach where we want to get to? So when all of that is said and done, it's a lot of work, it's going to take a lot of commitment, it's going to take a lot of resource, but one day we'll be able to pass this on to our children and say, this is the work that we've done. And so when all is said and done, just imagine an Africa that trades with itself. I always say this when I talk about the CFTA, that as countries, we trade more with the EU and, you know, the UK and the Americas and very little with each other. I'll give you an example with Namibia. Most of our trade, probably 60 to 70 percent is with the EU. But when I look at the trade with other countries, it's minimal. That is not what we want. And so we want to be able to trade with each other as Africa. We want to add value to what is produced in Africa. We want it to fetch the money that it can, because I think what we're trying to change is the rhetoric around take natural resource, put value and bring it back for Africa to buy. That's not sustainable. So in the long run, it's going to create jobs. It's going to create sustainable and scalable businesses. And it's just crucially going to reduce how much poverty we see on our continent. Okay. So I get a sense, Stacey, that uh, from your remarks, that Namibia wants to trade more with Africa and you want to dip in your pan-African business module, and also you want to, like Rwanda, bat above your, your position by being the logistics hub for, you know, Africa, well, Southern Africa and in turn Africa. So thank you so much again for coming to Afrospace. Um, from me, Adetun Jomotola, I'll say Odabo, Segobe, Kachifo, Thank you. Thank you so much, Adetunji. Thank you, Nyasha. Na totela sana, mushale wino, lesami pale. Okay, and for me, Nyasha Grace, it's Sarai Shwakanaka. It's not in the Kuti Sanganisa Komaita Pachirongwachino. Thank you. Yeah.